Yeah, so what was your first pedal? Uh, my very first pedal, I was 11 years old and my stepbrother got a guitar for Christmas, Strat copy, and I got like a soccer ball or something. And I was like, what? Lame. He got a guitar, what am I doing over here? And so, um, and I played my stepbrother's guitar all throughout Christmas and then came home and was like, I wanna get a guitar, that was super fun. You know, started doing chores and doing the whole thing and put a guitar on layaway, got a Strat copy and a, like a keyboard amp, probably like a $40, I think it was called Matrix keyboard wow. amp, you know. So I was 11 years old and so I have this and I have like, you know, a guitar, a Strat, very thin sounding, like what was a Nirvana, the Nirvana thing, right? Yeah, That's what yeah, I was going yeah. for. And then you plug that into a keyboard amp and that does not sound particularly great. Perfectly equipped to play nothing. For an 11 year old, yeah. <laughs> it's actually like kind of sick for an 11 year old, but still you're like, eh, this could use something. So I don't know how I would have figured out what a guitar pedal was at that time, but I definitely know like, well, I spent $200 on this little thing that sits in my bedroom, this rig, but like there's these little boxes that you plug in and they make the guitar sound better. So the very first thing I got was a DoD Classic Fuzz. Mm -hmm. It's an orange fuzz pedal, yeah. but I didn't know, see, like thinking back to that, I'm like, whoa, there's, it's crazy to be like, why would I have selected that? All I knew is it was some sort of form of distortion. It's gonna make the guitar sound aggressive and you know, like, punky and rocky or whatever. You know? Not like you're plugged into a keyboard amp. Correct. I mean, this is just now a fuzz pedal going into a keyboard amp. Still not good sounding, but something better. You know, you turn it all the way up. But it's funny thinking back, being like, whoa, I, I think that's like regarded as like a, a sought after fuzz at this point. And I just had it because it was orange or yeah, whatever. Yeah. But thinking back, like, I obviously, I had no idea the difference of gains and how they worked. It was just distorted sounding yeah. to me. So yeah, fuzz pedal. All those adjectives like flubby or whatever were years away at that point still. I, like I probably like literally just turned the knobs all the way up and I was like, that's how to make this pedal sound good. Yeah, I was gonna ask you if there was guitar before pedals for you, if you had any kind of like playing thing together before you got into the sound part of it. Cause sounds are obviously a big part of who you are as a player that comes out kind of sonically as well as melodically. Like, it's kind of blowing my mind to think on that because I don't think there was guitar before pedals. There was playing on my dad's yeah. guitar, sitting on the couch, you know, uh, like Strat copy plugged into a champ. Yeah. That would have been like my guitar yeah. pre any pedal related yeah. things. But I'm pretty sure like I, like I said, I went on a layaway and got the guitar and the amp and then probably figured out very quickly. Now this needs something to make this more fun for me as a kid wanting to play in my bedroom. So I don't know that they're like guitar existed pre pedals for me. When I want to get scared, I sometimes think about what was food like in like the 1700s or the 1800s, right? Because then all of a sudden, you know, there's spices and all these availability, you know, all the ways to kind of make things taste better. But back then there probably wasn't. So it was like, well, you could have it boiled or maybe we throw it over a fire, but really you could have it boiled. <laughs> Food was probably a horrific experience, which is right. kind of to me, the clean guitar thing can be like that too. Like 11 year olds were like, this needs salt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some pepper, <laughs> bring me pepper. Um, yeah, so uh, it was fuzz and then into like a phaser and then yeah. a delay pedal that I borrowed from my best friend's older brother who yeah. also played guitar, you know, the, the cooler older brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he had a digital delay pedal. And I remember plugging into that thing and being like, this sounds like that song I hear on the radio by U2. Yeah, right. And then all of a sudden you realize, I think that was a big deal for me realizing like, oh, I, I'm starting to put it together. Like there's, these are things that color the guitar and make it do cool things. And like, I, there's this song I really like and the, the guitar player is the edge and I can kind of as a 12 or 13 year old recreate some version of what I'm hearing. Yeah, that first time for me when I got a delay, my first delay was a uh, uh, Sureco tape echo, which is like an Echo Plexus junior brother. And the first time it did something that I didn't do, you know, it's like you play a note and then it plays something back to you and you're not actually causing that event to happen. That was magical. That was completely mind blowing. It's like, wow, there's a whole entire world out there. Yeah, I mean, I feel the same way like when you first hear feedback out of you know, by turning up all the knobs on a guitar, a guitar pedal and then standing close to the amp and all this, it's very dangerous yeah. sounding, you know? But so, 
Yeah, I guess either like, you know, setting a delay pedal to 100% feedback so you're getting a loop thing. Like yeah. I said something, well, I didn't do that. I didn't even touch it. It's yeah, just doing this yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Same with like feedback yeah. or like a flanger doing the jet sounds or whatever. Yeah, things where you don't feel like you're directly causing it. Those were all very, very exciting to me between the ages of like 12 to 14, discovering all these sounds that you can make with just a guitar and some, you know, pedals. Yeah. Yeah. Riley, where did you start with pedals? So I, um, I discovered phasers and I, I wanted a boss phaser. I would go to the guitar store and hang out until they basically asked me to leave. Uh, and so I wanted, I asked my parents for a phaser for Christmas. I was probably 14. My mom went to the guitar store and little known to me, the guy at the store said, you know what he really should have is a delay pedal. So I opened the, the box on Christmas morning and not knowing any better, I was disappointed. I'm like, this isn't what I asked for. Like, what the hell is this? Um, and just, you know, but then getting into it, I was like, oh man, this is so cool. Like just transformative and maybe does a lot more than what I thought the phaser was going to do for me. That employee was the true hero. Yes, yes. absolutely. Like, Don't, because my second pedal was a phaser. Yeah. Yes. And to adding a phaser to fuzz or some sort of distortion circuit is cool. Yeah. But it does one thing. Yeah, that's right. right. And, that's but right. It's a, and it's a specific thing that is very, can be very, very cool and is a very classic sound. But like thinking back, I'm like, mm, I wish I would have had like a really cool like delay pedal before yeah. I got into having a phaser pedal. Yeah, a delay can be a whole universe. A delay can be a whole entire salad unto itself. So is the space delay and the regular delay, what are the, what's the, give me the rundown. Yeah, like why, things. what they are. What are So they? they're so algorithmically similar. The processor runs a kind of a similar algorithm, but the difference is the regular delay is just a single delay repeat. So it's just a straight ahead kind of echo. And there's, there's three. <laughs> right. This moved really fast in this game. Wait, I, you I did your my, thing. I had my, well, I had my delay time set at zero, yeah. which was giving us no delay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check yeah. this out. Watch this single delay. Yeah. So just a really simple thing. Um, it's just a single delay voice. It's really great for, you know, filling out solos or whatever, kind of being melodic. The space delay is more like, multiple tape heads on a piece of tape. And so the type switch, there's actually, I think it's a pattern switch. And so it's, there's four heads out there, but the pattern switch selects combinations of them. So you get more kind of rhythmic elements to it. So whereas you have one repeat or, so it's like a quick, and then if you feed back that stuff and speed it up a little bit, Maybe not feedback that much. Gets into those kind of dry room kind of situations. Where it's not quite reverb, but it's not quite delay either. So can you give me like the explain like I'm five version of what it would mean to have multiple tape playheads? Yeah. So if, so yeah, right, we're getting this. Yeah. Ba, ba, ba. So what, what does that look like physically in a, an actual machine that's not yeah. a computer screen or whatever? And, and this goes back a really long ways. This goes back into, I think, maybe at least the 50s. There were um, oil can delays that would have multiple heads. Uh, and, and German delays like Echolets and stuff did this, the Benson um, stuff. So, and it's just, there's a drum that rotates and there's a head that records the information on the drum, and as the drum spins around, it passes through different playheads. And every time it goes by a playhead, the playhead goes, okay, I'll take that, and it throws it out the jack. So it's like playhead, playhead, playhead. So it's like dun, dun, dun. It went from being the drum-based thing into being more tape-based, and then that ended up being things like space echoes and that kind of stuff. And it's just interesting to me because it's more of a background texture. It kind of more fills things out without, like a delay, a single delay grabs your attention. You, you, you definitely see it as a discrete event. It's like, here I am. This thing, it kind of hides more because the delays can kind of mask each other. So, Which it does. I am a fan of not hiding the delay, yeah. which is like a very common practice, right? You do this sort of thing. And let's see if I, if I have this, you know, like, and then it kind of just goes. This one's going like crazy. Give me, give me a break. And it's kind of like this nice little thing that's happening. Actually, the thing with delay, 
a lot of times you don't realize that there is delay in a guitar part, right? If there's like half the times, like if there's someone shredding, there's an Eddie Van Halen shred or something, you know, a lot of that has like delay, even yeah. mixed very, very low. And it fills in that, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. that ambient space to just create, you know, more of it. But I do, I am a fan of like, let's see. I, I like the single repeat because then you get into the actual rhythmic and playing to it and it, you know, you create It's almost like playing with, with another guitar player. Yeah, so, okay, I don't know what this is set at right now, but let's see. So we're doing that ba, ba, ba. And that's fun because you've got a quarter note value and a dotted eighth note at the same time. So it's kind of like having two other parts playing along with you. Right. And so it's like a little trick that I, anytime I get a delay pedal, yeah. my first move is I take the time, I max out the time, yeah. and I hit the feedback at one, which sometimes on a delay pedal, that's zero. Yeah. Zero generally means one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One repeat, you know. Yeah. So that, and that just shows me what the tonal characteristics of the pedal are and like how it relates to what I want to put through it, you know? But yeah, so I, I like the one repeat trick. Yeah. So for me, like a lot of times I'll take the same thing, so the same rhythmic thing, um, and I will, um, I'll use it to kind of cloud up chord. Where I'm bending the neck more to get the chorusing, it's not so much like an overt chorus pattern. And the delay in that case just kind of, it's like this environment for the guitar to kind of exist in. It almost kind of serves a reverb purpose, mm -hmm. but you're But it's like, short, it gets out of the way. Right. While we're on these delay pedals, you have, you guys have modulation switches on these. So like, what is the, what is the basic version of what's happening when you flick those guys on? So that's like embedding a chorus into the delay a little bit. It just bends the pitch of the delay and it does it you know, kind of rhythmically. And there are trim pots, which you were talking about, inside where you can adjust the rate and the depth of it, and then just turn it on or off. In other words, kids, what that means is there's secret knobs yeah. underneath in the guts of the pedal, and you unscrew it, and That's you right. get a little screwdriver in there, and you can get even more sounds by tweaking those knobs. This is fantastic, because you're acting as a translator. So in the DSP, when you get into line 37 <laughs> of the code, what Nick's all, and so what that means is, yeah. it's awesome. And um, on a practical note, I'll just add that we only have one screw on the back of these pedals. And it's very that. easy to, to get inside and adjust those knobs if you want to. Yeah, in terms of design, that is really interesting because like, this is getting deep and nerdy, but just having one screw to access yeah. the back of a pedal yeah. is a little nicer, especially one that you could just pull out a quarter, so you know, the thick little guy exactly. on the back, as opposed to the screwdriver. So like, very, very deep, nerdy like uh, design. Uh, element that I thought was really cool. And it's a screw that you can't lose too. It's embedded in the enclosure. So it, it I just didn't even stays know that. there. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Too. Cause that's, you don't want to lose that one screw. I probably have 40 pedals at home yeah. that are missing screws right. off the back because oh, oh, like I'll hijack a screw from this pedal to go onto this pedal. Cause this one absolutely needs it or whatever. So that's a great design. Um, we talked about too, because you know, the, a, a trimmer like you'd adjust internally is the same thing electronically as a knob would be. So why not just put it on the box? But we were really trying to keep the box size small because I think everybody has crowded boards. People that use a lot of pedals have crowded boards and, and even people that are starting out don't have all the space in the, in the world. I will say that having gotten very deep into the pedal world uh, over the, like the last 10 years, you know, there's something to be said for the simplicity of three knobs, no stress, plug it in. And I, I mean, I could figure these out in 30 seconds. Yeah, you mentioned we didn't give you manuals, but hopefully you didn't need them a whole lot. I didn't need, I didn't need one manual other than to know what the, the trim pots were doing on the back. But, so I just think it's cool. Um, in other words, you have the options. There are the hidden knobs and you've, you know functions are there should you need them. But like a lot of the times you don't. This is like when you wanna go deep into like, you know, You wanna personalize it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, you can get down in there. Yeah, but I do like, um, I like simplicity in pedals, which I think is really cool about these. They're all uniform, you know, 
There's three or four knobs, a couple of switches. There's no homework to do on these. It's really plug and play, set it and forget it kind of thing. Yeah, we were, we were trying to build enough of a range of sounds in on these things where it wouldn't be too monochromatic, but you know, would there be room to play and have fun? But to try to keep the intimidation part of it down too for people that are just like, it's my first pedal and it's a phaser, or it's, a, it's like that's the very first thing I got into. Hopefully these are straightforward enough where somebody can just sit down and kind of find their way. Can I, why don't we kick on these, these gain fuzzy yeah. overdrive pedals and yeah. let's do like a brief synopsis of what we're hearing, what we're going for. Yeah. So yeah. like, all right, we got this fuzz pedal. I got an octave on. Okay, what are we hearing there? What's going on? With yeah, this? so that's a cool... There's, inside the fuzz are a pair of silicon transistors, and transistors are, you know, electronic components that amplify a signal. Um, the very first fuzzes use transistors, and, uh, and then later on in 70s technology, things got more modern, and it got to be about chips and that kind of stuff. But in the earlier days, it was more transistors. The 60s transistors were germanium, like early fuzz faces and things, and then people switched over to silicon transistors, which was much more common technology. So. Also, uh, germanium, they're like finicky, right? Like, yeah. Like the weather. Nine ways from those. Sunday. That's yes. right. So basically just not very stable yeah. in terms of living yeah, in 2022. Temperature. Uh, yes. I, I had a favorite 60s uh, fuzz that I put on top of a favorite 60s British amp, and the amp ran really hot, and it killed the fuzz. Okay, so. And, so, and then <laughs> yeah. the fuzz never sounded the same. So, yeah, they're they're. Um, they're finicky and and but they but they're beautiful and amazing sounding and they work really well well silicon transistors are a lot more uh, rugged and durable so yeah so at the core of this there's a pair of transistors that are in a kind of a classic fuzz uh, arrangement and then the octave switch actually uh, it flips the signal over in a way it flips the bottom half of the signal over so you know kind of if you imagine a sine wave it does that the octave switch takes the bottom half of it and folds it up into the upper half, and all of a sudden it goes twice as fast. So it produces what sounds like an octave. Um, always those effects work better if you're on the neck pickup, and generally around the 12th fret or something, you can hear it more clearly. Um, but these kinds of fuzzes like don't particularly clean up well. They're super squishy. Um, when you turn the gain down, it, it'll kind of lightly lope into being distorted, but it's not really dynamic. It's more like different levels of tone or texture, different levels of... Sure you know, kind of character maybe. It's funny that you say when you flip the octave switch up, it resembles an octave. Yeah. Because when I was, you know, younger, I saw the word octave on a fuzz pedal, I'm like, cool. And when you think octave, you think. Right. Gonna have some sort of like nice parallel thing, but yeah. that's not the type of octave we're talking about. Yeah, it's in a like fuzz a hint circuit. of an octave. A hint of an octave, yeah. well, so check it out. So here's the difference. This would be without octave. With octave. And if you get on your neck pickup. Yes, especially like right around this zone, right? I mean, uh, also, you play the two notes at once. Yeah. Kind of ring moddy and talking very 60s sounding. It's really atonal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, lots of fun stuff. So that's the fuzz. We did a wave of pedals that we started in 2018 and there's a gazillion of them now. And we didn't do an overdrive at that point because there were a lot of, you know, to me the overdrive started, I don't know who did the first one, if it was Boss or Ivanis, but somebody, you know, the Tube Screamer was one and, and Boss had their kind of version. And then there have been a bazillion variants of those. There have been like clones and imitations and copies and near nudges and we wanted to kind of avoid jumping in that fray. So we didn't do one initially because we didn't really have anything to say that would be kind of unique and different. When we did this line, we thought, well, actually, let's do an overdrive. Let's just have one. But it's not uh, particularly Tube Screamer-like inside. This one actually has an extra soft clipping stage after it, and it has the mid boost before it. So you can kind of really focus it on mids. And the thing that a Tube Screamer does, it's, it's likable, and then it's also something to be aware of, is it always leaks a little bit of the clean signal through. It does. Not a fan. Right. So when you Just. play a chord, you hear the distortion. We were talking about that earlier. You hear yeah. the distortion mixed with the clean thing. And sometimes yes. if you're playing through a clean amp, the clean thing kind of can be a little 
invasive. If you play a loud guitar, like a guitar with humbuckers, that clean signal gets really loud while the distortion signal still stays compressed. Yeah. Sometimes so, it feels like it's kind of just sizzling on top yeah. of your clean tone. Which is weird. Yeah. <laughs> so we put a soft clip stage after it so that anything that got through the distortion stage that was clean would get rounded off in a kind of an organic way. Like this. <laughs> And there's two, still kind of two things happening there, but they're both kind of distorted things that are, that are blending a little bit, which I think gets maybe a little more interesting. Um, is there like an overdrive for dummies answer that's like what separates an overdrive from a distortion? Because I've been playing guitar for, for 25 years. Yeah. And I can identify the sound, but I wouldn't know how to explain that to someone. I have a definition I use, but I don't think that it's you know worldwide by any stretch. <laughs> but to me, distortion is a thing that fundamentally changes the character of your instrument. It takes you into a different place. It, you know, the, the, none of the clean guitar leaks through, so what comes out doesn't resemble what went in. Dynamically, it's a completely different playing experience. You voice notes differently, chords behave differently. So to me, distortion is like putting on a whole different identity. Overdrive, I think, more takes the character of your guitar, and I think really overdrives were meant to take an amp that was already distorted or another pedal that was already distorted and push it farther. So I think of an overdrive as like a character modifier or a changer, and I think of a distortion pedal as being like this invasive, completely different character. Which there's also like the transparent overdrive wars, right? Yeah, you hear the word transparent yeah. a lot as it relates to overdrive pedals because it's almost like the goal was to give it the push without coloring the tone, yeah. so you make it transparent, clear, your tone is coming through nice and clear, yeah. so that's kind of, that's the overdrive yeah. world. Yeah, 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 and to me that's that, partially that leaking the clean thing through to still let some of the character of the guitar kind of occur. But again, for me as a player, I, the, having the pristine guitar clean tone back there isn't the most fun experience for me. Right. And I, I love the different place a distortion pedal takes you. you know, the, Distortion pedal to me unlocks your volume control and your pl and your playing technique. And a little tiny tap with your finger, fingernail scrapes, or pick lighter, or you know, or don't pick at all. Just just tap or whatever. All these things take on different characters through a distortion pedal. So you know, it's like just the, the raw power. You know that. that Wait. Thing. So does does that sound? Because that sounds like big. Uh, half stack sound. To yeah, me. yeah, that, yeah, I mean, yeah. That's what I'm getting from that. Yeah. And the gain's not very high on this at this point. So. Yeah, and it's all those things that if you play two note things or whatever, it just gets gnarly. Yeah. Let's see, what is mine set at? That's distortion. Yeah. I guess, I mean, sonically, like, here's overdrive. It's definitely distortion. Yeah, and I like to, I always strive with distortion pedals, too, to make the kind of the cleaning up behavior or the lower gain behavior be kind of kind of decent. So, like, where you can go from being kind of clean. I've always been so freaked out about having like the volume knob not all the way. I've never ever done been like, oh, I've got a, like a pedal on. And this might actually give me something new. That that is a different sound with like a dime distortion, and then you yeah. kind of start tweaking on the volume knob. A little yeah, bit. yeah. Never. I've been, I'm too scared to do that. Yeah. I was uh, just volume dimed all the time for a long time, but you know, uh, with good gain pedals, maybe you should be playing around with it a little bit. That's the thing, well yeah, because like, I mean, you have to remember, well you can, depending on the gain stage that you're working yeah. with, there is more sounds to be gotten. There's a whole range that. under there, yeah. yeah. And some pedals get muddy when you turn down, and you lose all the kind of the, the definition or the brightness of it. Um, we work pretty hard to not have that be the case in our like typical distortion pedals. This the same thing like the Pugilist, whatever from the previous series. Those things clean up pretty well. So 
I reckon the metal pedal must be a distortion. It's a little more symmetrical distortion wise. And what that means is, you know, so distortion pedals will clip a waveform. Um, and in the case of this distortion or the overdrive, sometimes it's fun to clip it where the top half clips a little differently than the bottom half. Um, it's called asymmetrical. And it makes it sound a little simpler, a little less com complex um, and clearer maybe. Well, with the metal pedal, it ends up being very symmetrical, which brings out a lot more of the high harmonics. Um, and so it just makes it kind of more aggressive or a little tougher sounding. And so it has a little more gain as well. Symmetrical meaning like if the wave looks like this, yeah. like the top is like a just straight up yeah. chop. Yeah, and the bottom is as well. So, okay. Yeah, and if, it. It, and if it were asymmetrical, you might see like the top would be a little rounded and the bottom might be like pretty hard clip. Got it. So, yeah, and so in this case, it's pretty, it does the same thing on both sides. And uh, it adds a lot of gain. So it has that same kind of feeling that a compressor has, where if you play quietly, it's at a volume. And if you play loud, it's at that same volume. It's like a cheat code. Yeah. You just have, you turn on a high gain distortion yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're like, it just kind of corrects itself. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it makes it really fun to play. It's really inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. Symmetrical clipping. Yeah. Not perfect picking, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But it gets there. It's 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 it gives you this great. To me, it gives you a great, powerful kind of feeling. It 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 just like you're hitting something with a hammer. You know, it's like you, you just feel like I'm hitting it with a bigger object than I have. Mm -hmm. um, Riley, you were talking about if you talk about metal, you could be talking about the early '70s, or you could be talking. There's about a pretty like wide the, range. Of, the, the new yeah. wave of British heavy metal, or you could be yeah. talking about. Yeah, and so like my feeling with this pedal is where it starts out is is fairly classic metal. Yeah. Um, I mean, it'll get pretty high gain, but it's a pretty classic sound. Something I like to do with this pedal is actually stack the overdrive in front of it to. Tighten it up and get that really aggressive mid-range grindy sound. Yeah. No one should be afraid of stacking distortion high at gain all. pedals. Yeah. At all. It only gets better yeah. the more distortion you add to it. The worst thing that happens <laughs> is your mom yells, turn that crap down. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, so. <laughs> Yeah, so, even at, turning on the overdrive gives it the mid-range, yes. which there's a trim pot on the metal, is there not? There is, that's that's mids, but it's there is after the distortion. So that's more like if you want to get a mid scoop okay. sound. That's a nice combo. Yeah. So and and it's, it just makes it more aggressive. In that case, the overdrive is kind of bringing out more of the teeth of it. And of course, you know, should also say by sometimes switching the order of the pedals, you sometimes it's negligible and you won't notice a difference. But there are pedal combinations by swapping, you know, this one with this one, you're going to get a completely different sound. When I was playing through the flanger delay and metal pedal earlier, when I had those you know, and I was kind of messing around figuring out what I liked out of them, I did whatever mathematical version of like however many combos there are, yeah. I probably went through all of those yeah. to like see what felt the best. And like I said, some of them may be very, very subtle changes, but there's sometimes you just hit on one thing where you're like, oh wait, this affects, there's like a domino effect based on how you have stuff set up. And that definitely applies to gain stages. Absolutely. We don't have a setup here, but do you ever put delays in front of distortion? I only put delay in front of distortion. Right on. I'm Excellent. a delay. Yeah. I want I want the delayed signal distorted. Yeah. I don't want the distorted signal delayed. delayed. Yeah. The delay it gets really um, chaotic fast when you do that, but it builds this really big complex picture of stuff. It's really kind of neat. You, know, you can play chordal things and then just kind of bring a single note, and the single note will wander its way out of the chaos mm -hmm. and appear. So mm -hmm. things like that. Are also, reverb as well. There's a big difference 
often. Reverb and fun of fr fuzz, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Just turns into this really massive wall of. Yes, it's a beast. Yes. Yeah, and for people that are experimenting with this, you can't hurt anything. Nothing will get hurt if you put anything in front of anything else. So it's really fun to just try different combinations of stuff. Yeah. Riley has uh, spent his former life as a NASCAR pit crew technician. <laughs> so. Yeah, I got fired from that, and that's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> Too much metal. <laughs> Okay, so here's my reverb, and and so all of that reverb tail is getting all fuzzed out. And yeah, just there's nasty. a weird like bloom. Yeah, he stopped playing and it kept going. Which yeah, which is funny. Especially with that octave. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. I like that. What? And so, okay, so here was this would be the opposite, right? A little more classic. What you it just almost expect. sounds like psychedelic. In yeah, way. It's almost you're, like a late you're 60s literally thing. taking a reverb, echoey wash. You're taking your fuzz and sending it through an echoey wash. Right. Whereas, just if you just like put the guitar down and think about it, think about sending an echoey wash through a fuzz. It's completely different sounds. The fuzz amplifies everything that it can, and so the reverb tails and stuff get. Amp, you know, processed by the fuzz as well. So they get pretty monstrous also. Can be hard to control, can make some noise. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, but sometimes that stuff is fun too. Noise, noise can be your friend. Also, it's just, even if it's really not good sounding, it's a fun way to just learn. This is yeah. like a very like non-dangerous, like experiment, kind of like a sonic experiment that you can just do, you know, on your bedroom, in your yeah. bedroom on the floor kind of thing, you know? Yep. I love stacking drives because sometimes there's this thing that happens with stack distortion pedals where the tone gets really super round and, and even and smooth. Well, and what's so kind of weird is that you know, we just showed you what these distortion pedals do on their own. They're crazy and like the metal can get over the top. Yeah. But then when you apply that type of playing to it and pick up position and where you're playing on the neck, there's almost like a like an auditory illusion because you're like, well, that's a really, really distorted signal, but it's so glassy and just like not clean it's sounding, pure. it's pure sounding. Yeah. So yeah. there's like your mind plays tricks on you when you hear that sort of sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. All right, modulation stuff. Like, give me the rundown on what's going on in the top right corners of these pedal boards. Uh, we've got two classic modulation effects. Chorus and uh, flanger, um, both somewhat similar effects, but uh, they, they have their distinctions, right? And, and, and in terms of their origin, sort of different. Stan, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, flanging uh, happened with tape machines, and it actually refers to the, the tape flange, which is the reel. Um, and again, in the 60s, and you, you'll hear this on Jimi Hendrix records, and there's lots of examples, but they would get two tape machines with the same thing on it. They listen to both at the same time. And obviously, if you slow one down a lot, you'll have like a delay. It'll be like that, that. But if you speed them up where they're running basically around the same speed, you'd actually put your thumb on the flange of one of the reels, and it would swoosh down. And then you put your thumb on the other flange, and it would swoosh back up again. So engineers and studios would sit between two tape it's machines. A physical... Ah. You're slowing down, you're actually, yeah, you're, you're slowing down the actual tape reel. And so you can get it to kind of go up and down 
like that. And, and tape flanging does this thing, like people talk about through zero flanging. Um, electronic flangers that use delays. With the tape machine, you can imagine, let's pretend this one just is playing. This one, I can slow it down, in which case the thing occurs behind this. But I can also speed it up, so this event would occur ahead of this. As it's speeding up, it sits at the point, it crosses over the point where they're exactly in the same place and the signal disappears. So that's called going through zero. So through zero flangers, which some digital boxes can do, actually the signal kind of goes and disappears for a second through it. Um, but still, flanging started from tape machines and engineers and touching the flanges mm. with stuff. And that doesn't sound too dissimilar to chorusing. Yeah, it's still modulation, yep. it's still pitch shifting. It's just choruses typically use longer delay times. Flangers mm. use like single digit milliseconds, three, four, five milliseconds for a flange. A chorus might be 10 or 20 milliseconds where you almost start to hear it like a separate note. Mm. You know, and short delays, your brain has a hard time discerning the two. When you get out to 40, 50 milliseconds, it sounds like two delays, it sounds like two things. In the middle ground, it, it kind of more becomes a chorus where it's like a second voice, like like a automatic double tracking mm. kind of thing. Wait, you're saying that about chorus? Chorus, yeah. Chorusing, yes. Yeah, flanging yes. always sounds like one thing. It always sounds like one guitar, and the delay is short enough where the main signal, it, it's called, it, it masks it. It gets in so close that you can't discern that there's two things happening. But chorus is kind of a murky middle ground. Sometimes you hear it as a little bit of a separate note. Mm. What is your, your flanger set to down there? <laughs> Pretty, uh, pretty standard, subtle, sweet, swirly. And uh, the hammer tone flanger has a type knob and a resonance knob. Uh, I'll show that off a little bit. Uh, the resonance knob is going to go through three different levels of uh, is it positive feedback. Am I yeah. correct about that? What is that chord you're doing? Because that chord is like designed to go through a flanger pedal. <laughs> it's very like 90 sound. What is it? Uh, I'm just doing a bar chord, but just leaving it open on the two high strings. Oh. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very, very 90s rock sound. Yeah. two modes on here, what are, what are they doing? So if you imagine the two tape machines, you can play them back where the signals add together or you could actually subtract them okay. one from the other. Yeah. Um, and so for people that know about phase switches or polarity switches, that's what that switch does. It takes those two kind of virtual tape machines and instead of adding, it subtracts. So it, it makes, uh, this thing forms a thing called a comb filter, which is this series of notches that kind of come along and it flips them over. And so it's just, a, just kind of a different tonality. Mm. Yeah, so that's... The jet sound. Yeah. Yeah, it gets the, more the jetty when they subtract. The flanger sound, well, that's when you hear the jet thing, like on a rock song or whatever, like if you ever can identify something that sounds like a jet, that's flan, it's a yeah. flanger of some sort. Yeah. Unless they got the audio from a jet actually taken. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> some <laughs> brave an soul. Way, a little easier to get that effect, yeah. yeah. Uh, flanging also, uh, the sounds that Riley has are actually pretty close to a chorus too. It's like Andy Summers and the police used flanging a lot of times when people would listen to the early police records and go, oh, beautiful chorus sound. A lot of times it was a flanger. Also used chorus. Yeah. Jazz choruses. Yeah, right? yeah, so yeah, like, yeah, yeah, true. So it, it, there's just, there's nuances between the two that you would need, you know, to be listening closely. Like, I don't know that I could pass 
an is it flanger or is it chorus test, yeah. I can maybe get, you know, 70%. Uh, but it's, it's obviously, you, these pedals go to, ex these are, that can be not subtle as well, right? You yes, get for sure. Extreme sounds out of these. So when you get into this kind of territory, you know, it's more. And then. You hear it more. That, that kind of stuff. I would say. I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I have a pretty good idea about the knobs generally and like, oh, with delay pedals or distortion pedals or whatever, but like with a flanger or modulation stuff in general, I'm just like twist to taste. Like I'm almost never even looking at yeah. what the label is and that's on it. Cause it's just sort of my, confuses me. So I'm just like, well, this yeah. one does this. I can, you know, describe what it's doing in my own, you know, funny adjectives and I just get it to where I like it. And that's know? a totally valid way to use any of these pedals or any pedals in general. Um, you know, go with your ear rather than like what the numbers are set to or what the label says. Totally. When I turn the flanger on, I think when I first got it, I was like in this space. I was like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's not really me. Yeah. You know, it's kind of funny, but it's not quite me. So I think what I did was I just went, I, I like went to the rate because I identified, oh, there's the wobbly sound. Yeah. That's what I kind of want to like chill a little bit. So I did this. Yeah. Kind of took me into chorus land. Yeah. <laughs> Like, Definitely hear a pitch shifted thing back there. Absolutely. Kind of yes. going up and down. Yeah. What about the chorus pedal? So now that we've done all the flanging. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is the difference between the chorus and the flanger in modern effects is more about the delay time than in the way that it's achieved. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. And flanging has feedback. Chorusing, you usually don't put feedback yeah. on it, but feedback makes it more visceral or something. But yeah, chorusing are a little longer delays, and it really is meant to be more of like a, just a detuning. Yeah. Almost like, you know, not a 12 string effect because not the octaves, but that same kind of thing where there might be two strings kind of slightly detuned from each other, you know. This trick. You want yeah. the real chorus? Right. When I'm like, when I'm in the studio and the chorus pedals ain't cutting it, I'm like, just detune the string yeah, yeah, yeah. in the unison. Strings. You know, and that's right, that's what you're saying. It's yeah. sort of like a detuned thing. So this would be the most natural chorus. And I reckon you could probably get something really close to that. Like. Also has like something I'm really into with chorus pedals, which I was finding uh, in combining it with like fuzz and other stuff. Is there's a widening effect mm -hmm. that happens, and it it feels like a, a volume drop. But really, what's happening is I don't I, I can't understand exactly what it is, but it just feels like it does this. Yeah, and I'm a fan of like some. How is this all of a sudden stereo sounding, but somehow that's what happened? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so we'll get uber geeky for a second. There's this thing called correlation, where two sounds get close enough to each other where they start to sound like one thing. Um, and so if sounds are correlated or not correlated, when they get to be so on top of each other they're correlated, they get louder, just naturally. And when they start to get far enough apart, the volume kind of drops a little bit, but you get this kind of spaciousness. Okay, so this is phasing. When yeah. something is out of phase yeah. and you're like, oh, you're like, let's say you're recording or you got an engineer and it's like, oh, that's out of phase. I need to do line it up. And then I'll, cause you're getting some, it's thinner, yep. thinner or yeah. whiter sounding. Stuff cancels. Yes. Some of the frequencies cancel. Gets canceled, yeah. Which is, so that's kind of what we're talking yeah. about. What's happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's intentional. It's obviously. intentional. Yes. Yep. And it's, and in this case also there's detuning. So one, you know, the, the copy that's moving around 
is detuned from the first one. So that's why you hear that same kind of thing as two guitar strings that are kind of beating against each other. Let's see what happens with a fuzz and a chorus. Okay, so here's fuzz without the chorus. It's a really cool sound. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, you can set this pedal so that you can get just the dry signal, in which case you just hear the fuzz. Or you can set it where it's wet, where you just hear the actual chorus voice. So are we getting into vibrato territory? Yeah. Or if you mix with the level knob, you start to hear the. So that is a blend knob. Yeah, it's a blend. It says level, but it's really a blend knob. Well, and the, that's just like, for people that don't know any better, yeah. like me when I was younger, like there's, there's certain language that gets used in the pedal world, which you just adapt to and you figure out. But like right now I'm like, oh, interesting. That's cool that that's a blend knob. I didn't know that yeah. about that, yeah. which just for whatever, you know, it's like a, it's semantics, it's tomato, tomato sometimes when it comes to what words get used, but I like that about that, that's cool. But you can get like this sort of sick out of tune sound. Because what, what we're hearing right now is you have, you're like at 12 o'clock, so we're getting your dry signal, yep. but also your heavily modulated thing, which is going out of tune and it's yep. doing that seasick thing yeah. where it's fighting each other. All right, Nick, so you're the guy in the guitar store, and mom's coming in, she's asking what pedal to get her kid for Christmas. Which one are you recommending? Was the kid good this year? Like, <laughs> Absolutely not. Not? Mm, <laughs> shoot. I gotta recommend, Miss, we need, you need to send, I need to send you home with two pedals, okay? Okay. Uh, first, we have to go just classic distortion, mm -hmm. because he's gonna plug this thing in, and he's gonna just feel like a rock god, okay? So, Definitely, we need distortion. And then maybe like later on, once he's, you know, understood the complex nuances of what overdrive and distortion and fuzz are, we could expand. But we're gonna go classic distortion. So I'm gonna send you with this orange guy. It's orange, it's, you know, colorful. Uh, and then I'm gonna insist you take a delay pedal. Not the space delay, we're gonna go classic, just delay. There's lots of fun stuff that, you know, you guys will get into, and um, I think you'll really enjoy that. They're simple to use too. You just plug them in, you know, you, you plug in here, up, up at the top, this is the power. Uh, do these take batteries? The digital pedals do not. The analog ones can take a battery. So we're gonna need a battery for this, which you could pick up on the way out, but you're also gonna need a power supply for these guys. Okay, so I'll send you home with one of those. I'll throw <laughs> one in. Uh, and yeah, so basically you just plug them in and you start turning knobs until it sounds cool. It's as simple as that, really. Yeah. How many times do your parents come to your room going, turn that crap down? You're onto something. Yeah, exactly.